So welcome. Thank you again for joining us. My name is Deanna Gerber. I'm the recruitment coordinator here at the College of Veterinary Medicine, uh, which essentially means that I work with students on their uh, road to vet school. Um, so one of the things I did want to say is that this is uh, the first in a series of webinars. Um, the next one is going to be on financial aid. Um, and so in the chat, uh, hopefully you've seen that uh, chat now light up so that you can uh, um, click on that. If you're not familiar with Zoom, most people are, I guess, by now, but um, you'll see the link to register for that. Um, I'll post it again at the end for students who are just uh, joining us. But a uh, couple of housekeeping things. Um, and actually, I'm going to do one thing first, one request first before we get into that. Um, in the chat box, if you could shout out your home state or your home school or both if you'd like to, uh, that'll give our panelists an idea of where you're coming from uh, and, and kind of who's represented here. So go ahead and you can either do that to, or you can either send that just to the panelists or to panelists and, panelists and attendees. Um, but just gives us an idea of uh, who's all joining us uh, this evening. So great, looks like from all over the place. You'll, you'll have to scroll quickly here, um, but fantastic. Thank you for doing that and keep those rolling in. I'm gonna uh, just point out one more thing. One of the things we'll do is use the um, Q&A box for our questions. Uh, so those you'll be able to actually review if you have questions um, and you see it, that someone else has the same question, you can hit the thumbs up button. That will move those questions further to the top and we'll make sure that we get to those uh, kind of most popular questions first. But now I'm gonna kind of stop talking and let our panelists introduce themselves, um, give you a little bit of a background um, and how they ended up here at Iowa State. And then um, Panelists, if you'll remember to mention your favorite thing about Ames, and it can be pre-COVID or you know, <laughs> kind of in the world we're in now. Um, but if you'd like to say your favorite thing about Ames, and then let us know a little bit about yourself, uh, Dr. Grooms. I'm hoping that you'll go first. I will. So thank you, Deanna, and uh, and really welcome to everybody that has joined us this evening. Uh, I'm so happy to see. Uh, uh, folks from all over the country as, as kind of the names went flipping by. Um, uh, a big shout out to the folks that are uh, joining us from Michigan. So prior to coming to here to Iowa State two years ago as the Dean of the College of Veterinary Medicine, I spent uh, just over 20 years at Michigan State University. So for those folks that, uh, that are joining us from Michigan, uh, some kindred souls there. So uh, welcome. Uh, so, so again, uh, welcome. Um, like I said, I've been here two years and uh, you're gonna hear a lot of great things about Iowa State University and the College of Veterinary Medicine today from, from our, our faculty members and members of the panel today. And uh, I wanna just encourage each and every one of you to make sure that, that you ask questions um, and, and get uh, whatever question you might have answered uh, tonight. Um, Iowa State's a, a, a great university. Uh, the College of Veterinary Medicine is, is the oldest College of Veterinary Medicine uh, public uh, College of Veterinary Medicine in the country. In fact, we just celebrated our 140th birthday last year. So we've been around for 140 years. So a long tradition and legacy of training veterinarians to care for animals and, and to support public health as well. So we're really excited to have you here tonight. I, I will tell you right now, my favorite thing about Ames is the fact that, uh, is the fact that uh, this time of year is it's just a beautiful time of the year. It's blue skies, beautiful sun, Sets. In fact, I'm watching a sunset out my window right now. It's just a beautiful time of the year uh, during the fall to be to be a, a member of the Ames community. And uh, you may think about uh, Iowa, you know, as this as this as this intense agriculture community, which it is. But it's also a very beautiful state with rolling hills and beautiful sunsets and big skies, you know, rivers and streams and all the things that you think about all over the country. So it's just a, a beautiful state to live in. I'm, and for the past two years, I just so much enjoyed being here. So welcome, and uh, Deanna, I'll turn it back to you for whoever's going to be next. Perfect. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Thipswamy, do you want to go next? Sorry, you're on mute. <laughs> that, that was a good start. Um, good evening, guys. Um, 
Uh, I am Dr. Tipes Swami. Um, I am known by Dr. Swami by students and Swami by my colleagues here. Um, I teach veterinary anatomy. That is the first course um, uh, you will see me. Um, that is the first day of the first class. Um, I do research in um, uh, epilepsy. I, I did my DVM, uh, BVSC equivalent to DVM in India, and I did my practice there and I was teaching in anatomy department and surgery department uh, in Bangalore for about uh, uh, nine years. Then I got a Wellcome Trust uh, funded and, and British Council funded uh, fellowship to do my PhD um, at University of Liverpool. Uh, I worked there for about 18 years. I taught anatomy um, and did research on nerve injury and epilepsy. And then I was attracted here to AIMS in 2012. So this is my eighth year and 34 years of teaching and learning anatomy. Um, that is my journey. Um, my favorite thing um, in COVID time, it is mask and face shield in teaching in anatomy lab. That was the great uh, time. I spent a lot of time um, spending time with, that is the, my favorite time this, this semester. Although it might look a bit odd, um, initially it was uh, intimidating, but really we enjoyed uh, the company of students. So we'll talk about that more. Perfect, thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, Dr. Fales Williams, you're next on my list. <laughs> All right, hi everybody. And thanks for joining us tonight. Um, I've always loved to talk about Iowa State University, so so you're a captive audience now. Um, I am a veterinary pathologist. I'm an anatomic pathologist, and I actually came here to Iowa State uh, in 1995 to do a PhD in residency. And we, my husband and I, hadn't really planned on staying. Um, some background. So I see there's some Kentucky folks on the list. So I went to undergrad at Kentucky, go Wildcats. Um, then I went to Missouri for vet school. So I saw there was also some Missouri folks. Um, and some William Woods folks on there as well, so hello. Um, and then we, we came here to Iowa State. Um, and we, we kind of fell in love with Ames. And uh, my husband was a classmate. He's a small animal practitioner, or as I like to call it, a real vet. Um, and I'm an academic vet. <laughs> um, but uh, we're, we've been here for 26 years now, and we really, really like Ames. What's my favorite part? Um, I think I really like the combination of being able to drive five minutes and be way out of town and be out walking in, in the fields and, and hiking around. Or if you care to catch a, in non-COVID times, catch a ballet or a, a symphony or something like that, it's just right here in the middle of town and it's not hard to get to any of those things. On top of that, I've always felt really safe here and very welcomed. Um, the number of times that I drove my car into a snowbank in the first, well, the whole residency period really. Um, and there was always somebody there to help pull me back out and shake their head and say, you're an idiot, which was true, um, but people help each other here. And I, I have always really appreciated that. So that's my story. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Ramirez. Yes, thank you. Glad to be here with you. Thank you for joining us. So my name's Alex Ramirez. So I'm actually originally from Mexico. Um, my mother was from Iowa. So when I finished high school in Mexico, interested in agriculture, came to Iowa State, um, graduated from Iowa State and was in private practice in Northwest Iowa for 10 years before I came back to Iowa State again. So I am uh, focused on pigs, so a swine practitioner um, and also I play a role as an assistant dean for academic and student affairs. And what I like from Ames is I think uh, like Dr. Phil Williams mentioned safety, you know, when you have children, uh, my youngest just started um, college here at Iowa State as well, but you know, for all my kids, three kids, uh, they could be out at night, hopefully not too late, but um, you know, I always felt safe, never, never worried about what they were doing or what, you know, they were getting in trouble or their safety in any way. Um, and then the other thing, I, I laugh at my wife, she's from Iowa but she'll be in a traffic jam because she waited two minutes behind a car that did move. And that was like the big disaster for the day. So you can move around pretty quickly, get everywhere. So it's a great place to live here in Ames, Iowa. Fantastic, thank you so much. Dr. Alba, you're next. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel Alba. I'm originally from Waterloo, Iowa. 
And I did both undergrad and vet school here at Iowa State. I then went off and did a private practice rotating small animal internship in Greensboro, North Carolina. And then I matched for an ophthalmology residency at Kansas State University. Following my residency, I actually stayed on faculty there at Kansas State for three years and then returned to Iowa State in 2011. And so I think that my husband and I calculated, we've lived over half of our lives now in Ames, Iowa. And um, I can't say enough good things about the city, about the state. Uh, I think that probably my favorite thing about Ames is even though it is a city of 60,000 people that has all the offerings in terms of plenty of restaurants and movie theaters and opportunities, I'm an outdoor person and I love that we have bike trails all over the city. We have all sorts of parks throughout the city that when I was an undergrad, I could literally walk just a few blocks and find some woods in the middle of town where I could walk my dog along the creek bed. Um, we've got nice recreational areas just right outside the, the city in terms of more trails for biking, hiking, tons of rails to trails opportunities here in Iowa, even if you're willing to drive, you know, just another 20 or 30 minutes. Um, so I definitely embrace the four seasons as Dr. Groom said, it is beautiful in Iowa. Every time of the year has a different beauty and that's really what I think re-energizes people constantly. I literally just took my kids skiing three days ago at our little ski slope along the the river where there are some hills and they have made some snow because we haven't had natural snow yet um, and the kids love those little winter offerings and so I think that you know in terms of an undergrad or vet student experience even though you are busy in school don't get me wrong you like to be able to have fun and find these um, opportunities close by at low to no expense. Fantastic. Okay, thank you. So um, we will jump into a few of the questions that you all uh, submitted uh, beforehand. Um, but go ahead and if you have questions for uh, any one of our panelists or you want to hear from all of them, uh, go and put that in the Q&A box. Um, so again, you'll be able to kind of type your questions in there. If you see a similar question uh, that you like that you really want to hear the answer to, uh, you'll hit the thumbs up uh, button and that'll move it to the top of our list. So while we are getting those questions rolling in, uh, Dr. Grooms, I'm hoping to uh, kind of uh, have you take on the first question, um, which is always a big one. So what makes Iowa State College of Veterinary Medicine stand out in your opinion? <laughs> um, thanks, Dean. I appreciate that question. So um, so there's lots of things, and I'll just try to uh, touch on some of the highlights that uh, that uh, that I believe really kind of set Iowa State apart from uh, from all colleges of veterinary medicine. And by the way, I I, I just want to say that that really every college of veterinary medicine here in the United States do an outstanding job uh, of training veterinarians. And uh, so I, I have a lot of great colleagues. Each and every one of us here in this panel have great colleagues at every college of veterinary medicine but they all do a great job of preparing veterinarians. Some of them have different things that they offer that are, that are, that are different than other schools. And so, so when you're thinking about choosing your school, you know, I guess I just pay attention to the things that, that fit what you want uh, the very best. But in the end, I can tell you that every school will do a great job of preparing you to be a veterinarian. So, so just a, a few things, you know, first of all, I've already mentioned the fact that, uh, that Iowa State is the oldest public uh, veterinary college in, in the nation. So we, uh, we officially were formed in 1879. We just celebrated our, our 140th anniversary. So we have a long, long tradition of training uh, of veterinarians that have served not only Iowa, but the, the entire United States, and in fact, uh, providing service around the world. So, so we're very proud of that legacy of training those veterinarians. Um, we have great facilities here. Um, it's unfortunate that you can't be here and really have a chance to tour our facilities, but, but the Lloyd Veterinary Medical Center, which is, which is our hospital, I'm sure Dr. Uh, Alba will talk more about that later, uh, just a fantastic facility that provides 24-hour uh, uh, a day, seven days a week uh, care uh, to both companion animals, uh, food-producing animals, as well as, as horses. Just an outstanding facility. It's about 10 years old right now. And, and just really a state of the art. Uh, also on the facility sides, uh, the veterinary diagnostic lab here, which is part of our, our teaching enterprise, is really the best veterinary diagnostic lab in the country. And in fact, we're just getting ready to uh, start building a new veterinary diagnostic lab here on our campus. We actually will be starting that construction 
uh, here in March. And so if you would elect to come here to Iowa State, you actually get a chance to watch um, that exciting project kind of develop in front of your eyes. Um, what, another thing that kind of sets Iowa State apart, and you may not know this, but also located in Ames here is the United States Department of Agriculture's National Animal Disease Center. So this is a this is a facility, it's a research facility that really does research on um, animal agriculture, infectious diseases primarily, but also some other things as well. So it's really the leading kind of uh, animal agriculture research facility. It's located right here in Ames. And in fact, we do a lot of collaboration uh, between the College of Veterinary Medicine and the National Animal Disease Center. Also located there is the National Veterinary Services Laboratory, which is uh, which is essentially a laboratory that uh, that uh, does uh, testing for controlled diseases or foreign animal diseases, diseases that that we're really paying close attention to here in the United States. And then also located um, at the USDA Center here uh, in Ames is the Center for Veterinary Biological. So that's actually where vaccines for animals are approved. So everybody's paying attention to what's going on with COVID-19 vaccines being approved by FDA. For animals, vaccines are approved by the Center for Veterinary Biologics, which is located right here in Ames. So, so really incredible collaborative opportunities between the College of Veterinary Medicine and our USDA uh, facilities. Um, another thing that, that really sets us apart, and I'll let uh, Dr. Uh, Ramirez maybe talk about this a little bit later, but no doubt that, that Iowa is, uh, is a center for production animal or food animal, uh, food animal uh, production. And one of the things that, that we are known for here in the College of Veterinary Medicine is really educating veterinarians to be part of the swine industry specifically. And uh, one, of, one of the really cool centers we have here is SMEC, which is the Swine Medicine Education Center, which is really a leading uh, center for educating the next generation of veterinarians to work within the swine industry, uh, not only here in Iowa, but across the United States, and in fact, uh, uh, globally as well. Uh, um, just talk real briefly about uh, about research. Uh, and, and Dr. Swami mentioned that that he does a lot of research on on epilepsy. That's kind of his focus. Um, we have all kinds of different types of research going on here in the College of Veterinary Medicine. Everything from from clinically applied research, so clinical trials or or, or clinical research, to very basic research, uh, benchtop type uh, uh, research. And, and one of the exciting things here as a, as a student is that you have the opportunity uh, to participate in research through primarily through what's called the Summer Scholars Program. So this is an opportunity that if you're interested in research, uh, you can spend a summer uh, with a, in a variety of different laboratory settings and, and just kind of wetting your appetite in research. I'll also mention that we do have, for those of you that are really interested in and maybe thinking about a career in research, we do have a dual uh, DVM PhD program. So Kind of a combination of getting your veterinary degree at the same time as getting that PhD degree. And uh, I can tell you right now that we actually just recently got funding to help support that program and offset the cost of education for students that are interested in that, that kind of dual career, dual education program. So in this case, a dual DVM PhD program. So those are just a few things I wanted to point out. And I'm sure that as uh, Dr. Ramirez and Dr. Swamy and Dr. Albaugh and Dr. Fales Williams, they'll also, they'll point out some other things that are really cool and kind of differentiate Iowa State uh, from other colleges of veterinary medicine across the country. So Deanna. Great, thank you. Uh, so looking at the q and I think uh, Dr. Swamy, if you wanna kind of uh, talk a little bit um, about uh, your question, which was kind of geared towards how has COVID-19 affected um, operations, classes, labs? I know our top question right now is specifically about, uh, or was, I guess now it's moved a little bit, um, specifically about how those first year students handled, uh, you know, their experience um, with classes kind of being virtual, labs being in person. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, yes, COVID had, um a lot of negative impact around the world. But for the class of um, um, CBM class of 2024, they turned that um, uh, negative uh, into a great positive thing. And the class average this time 
um, was significantly higher than any previous years um, since I started teaching here. And you don't believe, I mean, I'm, I'm really surprised when, I, when the results were uh, out after the final exam. Um, more than 50% of the class received A grade or A minus grade. I never heard, I never, anywhere in the world, if you think about anatomy course, it is the most challenging course in veterinary curriculum. So our students really achieved the best, I can say, in my entire 34 years of teaching. I never seen any such a, a, a great progress. Now, having said that, so some of you may be thinking, wow, in the name of COVID, uh, Dr. Swami might have compromised, so therefore there is uh, an inflation in their grade. Nope, we never compromised on the standard. That is the first statement I gave in my lecture when they started was, there will be no compromise on the standards in the name of COVID. So some students were asking, oh, Dr. Swami, what is the expectation under the, all this, um, you know, COVID related problems. So the first thing I said was, um, you know, so there's always high expectation from both ends. So you guys expect a lot. So we do expect a lot. So we both, you know, achieved that high expectations. Um, so in the first semester, we have two, you will have two big courses, six credit courses. One is histophysiology course that is also six credit course and dog and cat anatomy that is also six credit course. Um, so we were given choice. Um, I opted uh, along with my team. We uh, pushed for teaching in person. So we taught all lectures in person, all lab in person. Uh, there was no single day that we uh, excused ourselves or students excused themselves not attending the class or canceling the class. Nope. So we did all in person during this pandemic. We conducted all eight exams in person. Um, so that is another uh, big achievement. Lab exam, so very often people were thinking, okay, why can't we do virtual? Nope, nothing. So students um, appeared in person and we divided the class into um, batches. So there were two batches of, I mean, we were allowed only 50% of the class capacity at any given time. Um, so we planned uh, well in advance and hats off to our students. They cooperated so well. Uh, they took their responsibility and they rose to the occasion. And uh, so without their cooperation, probably we wouldn't have achieved um, the best results. Um, yes, it is a, a mutual partnership that really helped us to uh, achieve. Uh, assuming that we will be continuing that the same scenario this uh, coming year too. Um, so we hope to achieve this even, even the better. Um, having said that, we, we never made any mistake uh, despite all this uh, pandemic related um, issues. Um, so, but our meticulous planning and uh, the excellent uh, um, cooperation by students. Um, so we, we did, did best. Um, so we are hoping to do the same for, for you guys for the class of 2025. Um, so you will be all right. Fantastic, thank you. I wondered um, if any of the other faculty members kind of wanted to chat about um, what they saw in their unit. I know Dr. Alba, I'm working with the, and I guess Dr. Ramirez and Dr. Fails Williams probably all work with the fourth year students. So kind of thinking about, you know, kind of what did uh, like clinics look, clinicals look like this year? And I don't know if anybody wants to jump in on that too. Yeah, I can jump in on that, Deanna. Thank you very much. So COVID did kind of shut down our student in-person training experience between March and the beginning of July, but then we were able to have our clinical year students come back in July. And we've taken a lot of precautions, just like in the, in the first year course and the other courses in order to make sure we have adequate spacing and disinfection and everybody wears masks. But really from an educational standpoint, our fourth year clinical students are, are getting the same level of education as they have in, in years past in terms of we are still having a bustling caseload here in ophthalmology. We are, oh my gosh, booking two months out with our appointments. We see tons of dogs and cats and horses and everything with eye problems. Um, and I think that that's the same way for all the clinical rotations is students are still getting tons of hands-on experiences. And in terms of the 
I guess, underclassmen, the first through third years, like, like Dr. Swami said, they're still getting in-person labs. Yes, we are having to, you know, do more of those labs. So it's a little bit more work from the faculty side, but we are thrilled to have these training experiences for our students in order to really give them the best, um, you know, foundation possible for when they graduate. Um, one thing that I would just like to say about our clinic, which is different than some of the other vet school clinics, is we have both the small animal and large animal hospital in the same building. Our college is all inclusive, and that makes it very easy for students to, in the first through third year, come down and actually shadow in the clinics and get some kind of preview of experiences. And I have some students emailing me over this winter break that they're on of wanting to come down and shadow with us. And we try to accommodate that. And that's something that can be done in the block of just a few hours between classes. Additionally, that means when you're a fourth year student, you can get all your in-person clinical rotations in the same building and not like some of the veterinary schools where they have other facilities that might be a quite a ways away. And so that's just a side note that some people aren't really aware of that, that some universities have to deal with. Perfect, thank you. Uh, so. Dr. Ramirez, uh, kind of bouncing off of that, um, what are kind of some of the general um, opportunities for uh, folks interested in production animal medicine, uh, maybe even overlapping that with maybe some public health? Can you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely, glad to do so. So yes, so um, um, as Dean Grooms mentioned, you know, Iowa State is known for their food animal because we do have a, ver a very extensive food animal, especially in the area of swine. But I can tell you, our small animal, I can pair any of our students compete with any other small animal school out there. So although we're known more for, let's say, food animal, because many other schools don't have as a comprehensive food animal program, our small animal is just out outstanding. And we got some very high advanced technologies on all kinds of things um, that help our small animal practitioners be very competitive in the market. Um, so for food animal, we have the advantage because Iowa is heavy in agriculture that we do have faculty that specialize or focus on swine. We have faculty that focus on beef, faculty that's focused on dairy, faculty that focus on poultry, faculty that focused on small, animal, uh, small ruminants. So we have enough variety, both of cases in our clinics, as well as uh, our ambulatory service in our curriculum to really prepare you very well. Um, yes, I'm from Iowa State, but I can tell you, I don't think there's another veterinary school that will provide you a well-rounded food animal program. There's programs that have a really good dairy program, a really good beef program, uh, but Iowa State really prepares you in all areas of food animal. And if you're not interested in food animal, to me, one of the big advantages of vet med is the diversity in species that we get to deal with. So we focus on the science so that when you graduate, you can be well prepared regardless of where you go. Um, I know for one of our clubs, it's been a few years now, but we were talking to one of our graduates who's actually down in North Carolina and works in an aquatic medicine. And he said, one of his first things was develop a biosecurity plan. He said, you know, I just looked back and said, substitute fish for pig and took those biosecurity plans and implemented the same approach. Uh, we've got many veterinarians who are well known for their aquatic medicine who graduated from Iowa State because that science, that basic foundation is what really makes you give you that strength so that you can then develop it into whatever area you want to. When I graduated, I wasn't expecting to be a swine veterinarian, uh, but I became a swine veterinarian very quickly again because of that strong foundation. For public health is similar. We have some public health programs here and we got an outstanding uh, MPH, Master's in Public Health through uh, the University of Iowa, which is a human university that's about two hours away from here. Um, I got my, I obtained my Master's in Public Health from them. So there's a program that as you go through your DVM, you can get that Master's in Public Health at minimal cost by taking one course at a time and really better prepare you for population medicine. And as the university has been working with COVID, those of us with those uh, master's in public health degree, uh, Iowa State has relied on us on helping it provide advice and recommendations for testing, interpretation of diagnostics, 
um, some of those other public health aspects. So they've seen the value of having not only our diagnostic lab to run samples, uh, but also some of the knowledge and expertise and infectious disease that we have. And then finally, clubs. We have a lot of student clubs that are very, very active. This past semester, that's probably one of the areas where there was significantly less activity with student clubs. And that was just because students were trying to adapt to virtual and online. So they kind of put some of those things aside, but those will pick up and we have uh, food animal, we've got uh, uh, reptiles, we got zoo, we got uh, poultry, we got pathology, we got all kinds of clubs that really provide you that extracurricular training in the areas that you really want to focus to better help you be prepared. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so I think uh, next, if we can kind of shift gears, uh, Dr. Fails Williams, and talk a little bit about um, what you think the kind of best describes our culture or our, our community here at Iowa State. All right, happy to. Um, <clears throat> what I've observed over the years is that there's been a, a huge trend to shifting towards students being aware of, of health, their own health, um, whether that's physical health or mental health, community health, um, which, you know, I, I'm a 95 graduate and it wasn't that we didn't care about each other, but there was no national conversation about how to look out for each other or the veterinarians put themselves at risk by not taking care of themselves. Um, and so what I've observed with the veterinary students today is that they are very hardworking, they're very supportive of each other, um, and the, the links they've gone to to better understand mental health and activities that will support not just themselves, but their colleagues is really amazing. So case in point, um, while the students have always been very active in putting together 5Ks for um, one, one organization or another, um, this year with the, the help of the uh, RSR, so the Recreation and Stress Relief Club that has uh, some faculty members associated with that, they put together a disc golf course. Um, the, the campus here for the vet school is surrounded by a lot of open area. And so they, they saw fit to use that space and put a disc golf course out there, which is just an amazing thing. Um, the students took me out there to show me how to do it. And I was really, really bad at it. I only lost two discs in trees <clears throat> and one in the water, but, <laughs> but it, it was a really great excuse to get outside. It's just right out, it's literally right outside the building. Um, it takes you 45 minutes to do it. And that was all because some students got together with some faculty members and thought it was a good idea. Um, I, and I'm sure that they worked really hard to make that happen. And there was planning and organization and, and, and things that had to take place, but it was worthwhile to them to put that through. Um, so I, I just really admire that because in my day, I'm not sure that we um, we made t-shirts <laughs> about parties. So um, it, it's a really cool um, thing that they've done. Um, and I think there's also a very strong, um, you know, there, there's a trailer park that's right across the road um, from the vet school. It's not really even a road, it's more of a, a gravel lane. And what I see is that there's a lot of students that are going back and forth at lunch so they can walk their dog. Um, there's a lot of dogs that wander over here on campus after hours. Um, and so it's just, it's a very close knit group. Um, even though it's a very large student body, um, people really do look out for each other. And um, everyone seems to understand the commitment to not just their own education to treat animals, but that, hey, you, you need to get home and walk your dog. And uh, so there seems to be sort of that built-in mechanism for people to look out for each other and, and help each other get through their schedules. So um, that's that's one thing I can speak to about the culture and community here. It's it's one of support. And I think the, the sooner that, yeah, you, you see it all the time, students work so hard to get into vet school and there's a little bit of competitiveness that comes with that. And once people get into vet school, somewhere in that first year, they realize that they don't have to compete with each other anymore, that, that they're here and they, you know, the idea is for everybody to get through. And I, I see that, especially this semester with COVID and all the adaptations that we've had to make. Um, I see a lot of people chipping in to make sure that everyone gets through. And I'm really impressed by that. That's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, so I think Dr. Alba um, kind of 
going off or maybe along those same lines, you know, where um, we're trying to balance, you know, walking our dogs, attending class, and also maybe holding down a part-time job. Can you talk a little bit about what uh, job opportunities are available, um, you know, whether it's in the hospital clinics or, or wherever that are, that might be available for our uh, students? Yeah, yeah. So I'm aware of a number of uh, underclassmen who do have jobs within the clinic, obviously, as, as one of the ophthalmologists here, I'm most familiar with the clinic, but we have students who will work in the barn, you know, helping out, you know, cleaning stalls and, and doing evening weekend work with that. We also have students who work as animal caretakers in the small animal hospital. Now, obviously, we want you as veterinary students to focus on your studies first and foremost. But, you know, if you want to pick up an extra few hours, there are opportunities literally within the building um, that can be explored. Dean Grooms alluded to the option of the Summer Scholars Program. And there's a whole host of other kind of internship programs. I saw that was one of the questions in the chat, curiosity about like the surgery internship program and those sorts of things. And so those are summer experiences that happen between the first and second year or between the second and third year, because when you finish your your third year, you immediately jump into the fourth year. And so there's not going to be a summer work opportunity there. Um, but that just is a, a brief kind of overview as to what's considered a, an option for people. Deanna, can I just add uh, about the job opportunities? Um, in, in anatomy course, we, we do take as uh, teaching assistants, once they um, complete their first year you know, and they are in second year and third year, uh, they can work as teaching assistants um, in anatomy lab. Uh, and also uh, several research groups, they do take um, students during winter break and summer break as uh, uh, hourly, hourly paid, uh, um, you know, uh, as researchers, something like that. Fantastic. Um, great. So I think uh, the the most popular question actually on our Q&A list is when will we hear about admissions, right? So put, to put your mind at ease, very short answer of February 15th. So you have a couple more months to wait on that one, uh, but February 15th, you will hear about uh, admissions decisions. Um, but the next most popular question um, on our list and uh, Maybe let's see, Dr. Ramirez, you want to uh, start this one out and then the whole group can kind of chime in. Um, but uh, students want to know what qualities and characteristics does the Iowa State DVM program look for in an applicant? And I would say kind of what are what are we hoping for, uh, you know, that to kind of foster the community, right? What what are those characteristics and qualities that make a standout applicant? Absolutely. So, so as you know, um, grades do count into getting into vet school, uh, but there's a big portion of your score that also applies to other things. And some of the things we're really looking for is individuals who are going to be contributing to society, right? So things that you have done in the past to demonstrate leadership, that demonstrate uh, community service, passion for helping others. Uh, diversity is important too, right? And that diversity comes in many different ways, uh, not only related to race or nationalities or other things, but that there's many other ways that diversity contributes to a more open mind, more challenging thoughts of ideas. So really the students that succeed are those who can perform academically, obviously, but also those who really are engaged in the community and want to learn. Um, so a lot of you, hopefully in your applications, you know, highlight some of your experiences to demonstrate your leadership and your role in um, being able to really have a passion for the profession and wanting to learn. Um, because that's what we're looking is we're really looking for individuals who can make us proud of them being part of our profession. What species of interest really doesn't matter. We don't evaluate your species of interest because we know those can change. We know some of those are limited based on experiences, right? Uh, but we're more focused on you as an individual, what you can contribute to our environment here at, at the veterinary school and the diversity and knowledge and experiences and leadership that you bring.
Anybody else want to chime in? I think that was a great list, but I didn't know if anybody else wanted to add anything Dr. Fails Williams looks like. Um, I would just add in that um, being able to handle a volume of information and uh, maybe getting yourself in a little bit of a, a deep spot and getting yourself back out of it can be really helpful um, because uh, I, I've yet to see anybody come through here and just um, be perfect every day that they're here and be perfect on every single test. I don't think that's possible. Um, so there's going to be times that you struggle a little bit. And uh, if you've already had the opportunity to have that experience and, and you struggled your way right back out of the struggle, then uh, that that's great. And that um, I, I guess I, I guess what I'm saying is if you've had a struggle, that's nothing to be ashamed of that can actually um, demonstrate that you know how to get yourself out of a bind. And if I can add to that, Deanna, I think I think Dr. Ramirez and Dr. Fails Williams have really said said it well what we're looking for. But I think that what Dr. Fails Williams was talking about is really resiliency, and I think that's so important in our profession um, is is to be resilient because uh, whether we're talking about COVID-19 currently or whether we're talking about having to deal with difficult clients uh, when you're in practice or or uh, a research project that fails, you have to be able to in this profession to be resilient. Uh, uh, when when failure occurs or things don't go the right way, and I think that's so so important in our in our profession. And so I think you know one of the characteristics or the characteristics we look for is demonstration of resiliency um, prior to a, a applying to veterinary school. So so if you have those examples that you can that you can talk about in your application, I think those are really helpful in us helping to identify those very resilient people. And I will just say I'll, I'll be upfront and honest with it, each and every one of uh, the folks that are here today. Um, uh, and I think uh, Dr. Swami kind of alluded to this earlier. Um, our, our students have been so resilient this, this semester. Uh, in addition to our faculty and staff, our whole community has been incredibly resilient during very difficult times, admittedly difficult times, but they've been able to, uh, to bounce back under these difficult times. And as Dr. Swami said, the first year students have, have performed excellently despite the difficult times. And that's because I think we've selected really, you know, excellent people that are resilient and can deal with these uh, with these hardships. Great, thank you. Uh, kind of following up on that, um, and um, it, this question is kind of for any anyone here, but um, so as far as the student who may be struggling, and maybe Dr. Swami, you wanna you wanna kind of be maybe first because I know. Like you said, that anatomy class uh, is is very challenging, even first year. But um, what are some tools that uh, students can kind of take advantage of to, um, you know, kind of get extra help um, or kind of struggle through those struggles? Right? How do we help them with that? Um, yeah, this is this is something I I am quite uh, um, personally involved in uh, supporting students. Uh, I. I want every student to achieve their best. Um, so we want to give all possible um, support, whatever we can. So we go extra miles, not mile, extra miles to help everyone. Um, one, one thing I, we always notice um, is um, when you are in uh, year one, the first couple of weeks, you will really, some of them will start immediately start working on um, on the course contents and some of you coming from the undergraduate background thinking that, okay, so I know I have taken all the courses. I was the best in my class. And, uh, but remember there are several bests in the, in, in, in the, in, in the veterinary first year. So there are 136 or 140 best students, all are best. Um, so if you start late um, in your review of material, that will be a disaster. So make sure that plan you are here by, by choice, not by chance. Um, so we all have our weaknesses and learning methods and especially for anatomy, this keep saying, not everyone take, uh, have taken anatomy, um, but one caution is those who have taken anatomy, not the same anatomy, what you will learn here. This is a different applied anatomy, clinical anatomy. So be prepared for that. Um, so another important thing I keep saying um, for my students, um, identify the weaknesses. 
Uh, don't assume that what you know, everything is, is right or there are some weaknesses. There will be some weaknesses. Uh, identifying those weaknesses uh, will help you to do better. Um, so the strength of the uh, chain lies in its weakest link. So identify that. So uh, again, um, Dr. Dr. Grooms mentioned that resilience and determination, determination, determination. I mean, if you are motivated, you will find your way to um, get the best out of you. Um, we are here to help. Uh, so we, we, we have excellent uh, resources to help students to achieve their best. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, Dr. Fales Williams, I think you've got something to add. Right, so I was just gonna piggyback on that, that we do have a tutoring program as well um, that's run through the Office of Academic and Student Affairs. Um, and I would also say that if you have questions, ask your teacher. Don't wait three months into the semester when you're panicking. If something doesn't make sense, we we expect you to come ask us. And if we don't hear those questions, then we're left to assume that, okay, you've got it. And and I there's been many times I've left the lab or the classroom knowing that at least 30 people in the classroom had a question. And I can tell you, if you have a question about the lecture or something we did in lab, I guarantee you that 30 other people have the same question. And I know that because I've taught for a while. So ask the question because uh, you won't be alone. There's no shame in asking questions. And uh, I, your classmates are gonna have often that very same question. So that's my piece of advice. Fantastic, okay, thank you. So I know we've got, uh, we're, we're coming to the, the last uh, quarter hour or so here. Um, but I want to, there's been a kind of a running theme in some of the questions, um, you know, which is, which really kind of centers around um, if I have a specific interest. So we kind of talked about how Iowa State teaches really broadly, um, which is wonderful because it gives you a good foundation. But um, if I have a specific interest, say, you know, equine, exotics, um, parasitology, those sorts of things. Um, I think uh, Dr. Grooms, can I kind of put this to you and then um, everybody else can kind of chime in as well. But um, it, what ways do we help connect students with their uh, specific interests? So it's a great question. And, uh, you know, the way I will, I will answer that, first of all, we have a variety. I mean, we have a broad training program here that, that provides uh, the potential for experiences in lots of different species and lots of different areas. So whether we're talking species, equine, food producing animals, companion animals. Um, I saw a couple questions about uh, experiences uh, in, in zoos. Uh, so we have a relationship with the Blank Park Zoo, which is in Des Moines. And, and we routinely have students down there with their veterinarians uh, doing, doing internships or preceptorships, as well as other zoos uh, in the area as well. But you know, we may not have every experience that a student may look, look for, right here names, but that's where we have opportunities to, to connect people with other schools or other opportunities across the United States or even internationally. And that's gonna be true of any college of veterinary medicine. Not every college of veterinary medicine can provide training in, in every area or every niche that everybody wants to experience too. But what they can do is help provide those connections to those opportunities uh, so that they can get those experiences. And one of the things that I will say is that, is that what we do very well is really provide that, that solid foundational training and experience that once you leave it here, you can then build upon it in the specialty areas that you really want to be in or those niche areas that you want to be in through continuing education. We are all lifelong learners, right? We have to understand that we'll never learn everything in the four years that we're in the College of Veterinary Medicine at Iowa State University. But what we will establish is a solid foundation to build upon no matter what area or what way your career takes you from here. And it's that foundation that allows you really to, to transition and change over time. I, I, would, I would bet that if you ask most veterinarians out there, are they, are they, where, they where they thought they would be when they were in veterinary school? When, and they will, most of them will say, no, I'm not there. I'm, if somebody will say, were you going to be a dean of a college of veterinary medicine 30 years ago? I said, absolutely not. But, but things happen over time. But what I, what I had when I got my training at, at Ohio State University, that's where I did my school, I had a solid foundation which I could build upon over years. 
uh, and get into the different niches that I want. So that's how I would answer that. Do we train everybody or provide all the experiences that every single potential person might want? The answer is no. But can we help you get there? The answer is yes. Fantastic. Thank you. So um, we have about 10 minutes left. And I know that this is one of, uh, one of the most popular um, you know, questions here as well. Um, so it's time for, I think, maybe the biggest question, <laughs> um, which is, and I, I'd like each one of you to kind of, uh, you know, answer this or, or give some advice. So advice to that, you know, incoming VM1 student, whether it's Iowa State specific or just kind of, you know, advice for them um, in their veterinary sc uh, school career, wherever they end up. Um, so what piece of advice would you give to an incoming first year student? Um, and let's see, maybe we'll, we'll start with uh, Dr. Alba and we'll, we'll kind of go around, I think in reverse order from what we did in the beginning, but. Yeah, okay, so in terms of veterinary school advice, it was alluded to by other panelists already is, is just don't get behind, you know, stay up to date with the current lectures. I know that the, the courses having been virtual to some degree this semester did require students to start some time management and make themselves watch pre-recorded lectures on schedule, not let things build up. And so if that's gonna be the landscape of next year, I would encourage the exact same thing. Stay on schedule with getting through your materials. I'm a big fan of telling my advisees, try to look through the material prior to class, say the night before, be present either virtually or in person for a lecture or a lab, and then review the material that same day at the end of the day. That way you're seeing things three times in less than 24 hours, and that's going to allow you to make pertinent notes, highlight things, whatever, make it easier when it comes time to study for the exam. The other non-veterinary school piece of advice I would give is make time for yourself. Schedule into your day exercise or recreational reading or meal prep, something that is going to be kind of a self-care thing because I think sometimes veterinary students and faculty and other people feel that we don't have time for ourselves. And that's where I see students getting burnt out when they just feel that they're having to study all the time and play catch up on tests. And so get that as a part of your routine from the outset, whether it's just 30 minutes or whatever, I think that's incredibly important for well-being as a veterinary student and success in the, in the curriculum. Fantastic, thank you. Dr. Ramirez, would you like to lend your piece of advice? Yes. So. I think it's already been mentioned, right? But to me, even as uh, assistant dean for academic and student affairs, I still tell them, you know, the number one thing is once you get into vet school, we've already determined that you can do it, right? You've already proven yourself. So that's a time where you can kind of forget grades. I know that sounds awkward, but really focus on learning the material so that you can be a veterinarian, okay? Nobody's going to care whether you got a 98 or 99, right? Uh, what they want you to do is be a veterinarian. So learn material because you want to learn it to help animals and not because you want a little bit of a better grade. We can't all excel in every subject matter. So most of us do have a subject matter we struggle with. And the important thing there is just recognize that early on and seek that help. We have tutors, like it's been mentioned. We've got instructors who are very helpful, right? That will work with you if you work with them. Um, so focus on doing the right things and then make time for yourself. Pick a day, Friday afternoons or Saturday mornings are your times um, and, 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 and schedule it for you to just have off time. There's always time to study, right? But what happens is if you focus too much and study, 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 you'll get burned out. And the last thing you want is to graduate hating the profession because you're burned out. That doesn't mean you don't study, right? You, need, you do need to study and work hard, but you need to enjoy life, but you need to learn the material so that you feel comfortable with what you do and what you practice and not because of a grade. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Fales Williams, you're up next. All right, um, two things. Um, and I'm sort of rehashing what's already been said, but first thing, believe you belong. You're here. Um, you can waste a lot of time and a lot of, of your heart energy 
on running yourself down or feeling like, oh, I should have gotten a, a higher score on a test when in reality, the numbers don't matter. The, the information that you're putting into your mind so you can build on that and use it later, that's what really matters. So believe you belong and interact with your, your colleagues, um, with your, your classmates and take the opportunities to learn about them, learn about their journey. Um, Cause you're, you're gonna be classmates for four years and you're gonna have a really good time together at, while you're working really hard. So um, that will be more fun for you if you believe you belong. Um, and the second thing is that we learn in layers. It's kind of like when you are trying to paint a wall and you're using a, a roller brush to, to uh, paint things, you, you never really get all that paint on in one layer. And if you did, you're probably using so much paint that it's just gonna dry and crack and fall off. So um, take a couple passes at it, read the information before lecture, even if you're gonna absorb 10% of it, your brain is gonna pick out a couple of words and, toss those words around all night long, and then you're gonna hear them again in lecture and it's gonna stick a little bit better. And then when you go to look at it later, you can just really enhance that learning. And it sounds stupid and it doesn't feel like you're getting that much out of it when you read it and all the words seem foreign, but that's the way our brains work. So um, believe you belong and we learn in layers. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Swami, what's your advice? First thing I would uh, advise students when they move to Ames um, on their painted wall, put their name and the DVM next to their name. Look at that before going to bed, determination and motivation. Those are the two things um, they can drive. Um, so again, um, others have said several things, believe in yourself, trust, CVM faculty, we are here to take you through this program and to make you to reach your targets. Have a big picture of DVM. That is your dream, right? Thank you, thank you. Dr. Grooms. Sure, I, I think uh, everybody's really has provided some great advice. And, you know, I would just, I would just say that, uh, you know, it's, it's important that uh, coming into the College of Veterinary Medicine, uh, where we have a very demanding curriculum, that you, that you think about how you can take care of yourself during four years, because that's really going to set the stage for the rest of your career. And, and, and that's one of the things we talk a lot about here is making sure that each and every one of our community take care of themselves now, that we demonstrate you know, well-being to our students, because really that plants the seeds for those students when they become when they when they when they get that DVM, when they get the diploma that 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 signifies that they are now a veterinarian, that they will continue to take care of themselves uh, as they become a practitioner, or they become a researcher, or they work for USDA, or whatever wherever their career takes them. We need to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves because that's really really important. This is a stressful uh, career. There's no doubt about it. We know that, and I think it's important that that we as we go forward think about how we take care of ourselves both mentally and physically, because it's going to be important uh, in our career going forward. And that uh, I saw a couple questions about, about well-being, and certainly that continues to be something that we stress here in the College of Veterinary Medicine. You know, we want to create a great place for our students to learn and a great place for our faculty and staff to work in. And we work hard every day to try to create that, uh, that environment for that that's a well place to learn and work. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, I want to say thank you uh, all for for being here to our faculty and, and for Dr. R and to uh, Dean Grooms for being here. Uh, thank you for attending as well. Um, there are a few things, uh, kind of housekeeping things that I'm going to try and do really quickly in the last minute here. Um, but I know that there's a bunch of great questions that we weren't able to answer. Um, we do, I do host kind of an open office sort of, uh, you know, thing on Thursday uh, afternoons. So you'll see the registration for that webinar in there. You're welcome to attend one of those and, um, you know, ask questions there. If I can't answer the questions, I can connect you with someone who will. Um, the other thing too is some of kind of the uh, kind of general questions about technology, uh, housing, and everything can be found on our incoming students page. So that's a really great resource 
uh, for you going forward as well. Um, reminder that we do have on January 12th, we have a webinar uh, with financial aid and I'm gonna scroll quickly up to the top and uh, let's see if I can copy and paste that uh, financial aid information. And then mark your calendars for February 16th. So that's the day after offers come out, uh, we will have a student panel. So you can ask all of your student life questions uh, to our fantastic current students as well. So um, so all of that information is on uh, in the chat for you. I will hang out here for a few minutes so that you can copy and paste and click on links and everything. But uh, thank you once again for logging on and thank you again, faculty uh, and Dean Grooms uh, for being here and, and sharing your information. Go Cyclones. <laughs>